Hi, my name is Amy Sullivan. I am a health psychologist, director of behavioral medicine, research and training at the Mellon Center for MS. And so today I am really privileged to be presenting the science, art and practice of behavioral medicine for um, our virtual CMSC conference. Of course, we all wish that we could be in Orlando today, um, but hopefully this is a, a good second best. And I really appreciate the works of June and Tina and your team for putting together this virtual um, opportunity. So these are the accreditation and uh, credit designations today. And so I just wanted to leave those up there for a moment so you can uh, figure out which uh, category you fall into and how to gain credit. In addition, I am disclosing um, my financial relationships, both consulting and speakers bureaus, um, but I believe that none of these relationships will impact my ability to present an unbiased presentation today. And then just a disclaimer is that some of the images that I acquired are from Google, <clears throat> and I don't present them as my own image. Okay. So let's get to the learning objectives. So I have quite a few. Um, clearly, it was difficult to put together a one hour presentation on something that I think is so important in the field of MS care, specifically, how do we manage the emotional needs of our MS patients. And so, um, as you can see, I wanted to first talk a little bit about the research. So what is the cost of the chronic disease and mental health uh, conditions? Um, next, I want to talk about the improved ability to assess and understand the person with MS pass. Next is to look at the multidisciplinary nature of MS and MS care. Next is to discuss strategies to manage depression, anxiety, and stress. Next, we'll talk about the three um, behavioral medicine treatment and needs that we see the most in our practice. Um, we will then look at the mind-body connection, and then we're going to incorporate some skills in stress management and resiliency, and hopefully um, this will be helpful for you as well. Okay, so first let's talk about the dollars and cents. So we're just going to talk a little bit about chronic, chronic disease and its facts. So chronic diseases are among the most common and costly conditions in the United States. Um, the research suggests that about 50% of all adults have at least one chronic disease and 30% of 18 to 44 year olds have a chronic disease. Um, one in four adults have two or more chronic diseases and seven of the top 10 causes of death right now are chronic disease. So when we look at the dollars, um, the overall cost is estimated to be about $2.5 trillion annually um, in taking care of chronic disease. And the estimated cost of cardiovascular disease to the nation is 316 billion. So um, my goal really and what I practice in, in um, the Mellon Center and with, uh, with behavioral medicine is really a preventative uh, model in incorporating wellness um, in terms of helping um, our patients to live overall good quality lives. So let's look at some of the literature. When we look at a Chrome Key study, from primary care um, with regards to dollars. He looked at a thousand patients reviewed from Brook Army Medical Center and looked for evidence of 14 common symptoms. So chest pain, fatigue, dizziness, headache, edema, back and abdominal pain, insomnia, and numbness. And the researchers found that 62% had no significant symptoms, though they were chronic problems. 74% of cases there was not a cause that was found um, of the symptoms. Only 16% of the symptoms were due to an abnormality of a body organ. And this kind of hit home to me. The majority of visits in primary care were related to behavioral health needs, but not identified as mental health disorders. So let that sink in for a moment. Okay. This is a study on depression. So in this study, 75% of patients with depression presented physical complaints as the reason that they sought care. Most people who would benefit from behavioral medicine services to relieve the physical symptoms rarely think that behavioral medicine is what they need. And I find this very frequently in our practice as well. Um, those diagnosed with depression have about two times the healthcare costs as those without a diagnosis of depression. 
So again, just presenting some literature for you to just sink your, your mind into um, how important it is to really try to uh, diagnose that mental health condition. So again, looking at the dollars and cents here, um, a review of 91 studies found that patients actively involved in behavioral uh, health treatments reduced their overall medical costs by 17%, whereas those not participating increased their medical costs by 12.3%. And so what we know is that the more targeted the behavioral medicine interventions, the more medical savings, thus the need for specialists and disease centers. So for example, in the Mellon Center, um, our behavioral health team focuses on MS care. Um, only neurogen neurodegenerative care and uh, MS care. And so we target um, specifically to the needs of the MS patient. And this is the Kaiser cost saving study. And so uh, at Kaiser Permanente, they were able to do some research on patients who received psychotherapy. And they showed that there was a 77.9% decrease in average length of hospital stay. There was a 66 percent decrease in frequency of hospitalizations, a 48 percent decrease in number of physician office uh, visits, a 45 percent decrease in ER visits, and a 31 percent decrease in phone and medical record contacts. I just love this study because this is a direct link of how psychotherapy can help um, with uh, the financial needs of the hospital. So let's move into um, the chronic disease the patient experience. So as we treat our MS patients, this is kind of my own Rorschach of what um, our MS patients look like. And we're all gonna come to the table with adjectives to describe this patient. And so what I'd like for you to do is just take a moment and think in your head the adjectives that you would use to describe this patient, your patient. And so these can be very positive, resilient adjectives, and these can also be difficult um, adjectives to describe what your patient may go through on a regular basis. And so as I've done this in the past, what I find typically are that there are just some wonderful attributes that are described about our patients. Very resilient, um, people who uh, take their treatment very seriously, um, and people who may have some symptoms, some invisible symptoms. And so what I typically find is that after we're done describing the very positive, resilient attributes of our patient, um, people are then able to talk about some of the more invisible symptoms of our patients. And so let's talk specifically about the invisible symptoms. So when we look at our patients, um, we often find that the invisible symptoms are the most debilitating symptoms. So we see fatigue, and fatigue is oftentimes described as this 24-hour flu, um, occurs in about 90% of the patient population. Um, cognitive symptoms are often described, and these um, occur in about 60% of the patient population. Pain is described very often, and this occurs about 89 to 90% uh, in our population. Sexual dysfunction in both men and women occurs in about 70 to 72% of the patient population. And then when we think about mood symptoms, which is something that I'm very uh, passionate about uh, managing and helping our patients with, this is in about one of every two of our patient population. So what we know, again, is that these symptoms are often the most debilitating symptoms of our MS patients. So let's look specifically at mental health disorders in um, neurological conditions. And I'm just gonna leave this up there because I was able to pull uh, the prevalence of um, many of the neurological disorder uh, uh, mental health uh, prevalence data. And what you see is that under stroke, so stroke is um, 18 to 61% um, have some sort of uh, depression. Um, you see that multiple sclerosis has a very high prevalence of depression. So up to 54% of our patients are diagnosed with depression. And I think this is very important for us to, um, 
to, to realize because again, one in every two of our patients is diagnosed with um, a depression. And so this is something that we can manage um, as a team and we need to be able to manage this for our patients because you know, I, I always say MS takes so much from our patients, but we don't want it to take it, the person's joy as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why it's important to treat uh, depression. So depression has many things that are difficult. And um, in terms of our patients, it can decrease quality of life and disability, um, can decrease adherence to treatment. And I see this across the board. So everything from starting a disease-modifying therapy to then uh, participating in auxiliary services and PT, OT, speech therapy, um, psychological services, social work. Um, so I think we need to be very uh, on top of, of the patient's depression specifically uh, related to adherence. It can also cause apathy in treatment decisions, relationship stress, and suicidal ideation. And so here's a graph of our mental health prevalence rates in multiple sclerosis um, compared to the general population. So if you look here, um, the MS population is in orange and the general population is in green. And um, again, statistics are sometimes difficult to, to, um, to find because um, I think reporting is different. People may or may not report their symptoms. They may underreport their symptoms. Um, and so when we're looking at depression, I usually uh, say somewhere between 50 and 54% of the patient pop MS patient population has some sort of form of depression. And what we note is that this is three to four times greater than the general population. And what's unique about this is that this is an actual diagnosable uh, depression. So this is somebody who meets the criteria for major depressive disorder or dysthymia or mood disorder due to general medical condition. Um, this is not just people who have symptoms of depression. So when you look uh, specifically at, at our patient population, our patients are likely experiencing symptoms at a greater uh, pr prevalence than 50%, but they don't meet the diagnosable criteria. With regards to anxiety, um, we see about 36% of our patient population with anxiety. Um, and again, I think anxiety is very difficult to measure. It comes with underreporting um, at times. Um, it's also a state versus a trait. Um, so is this a, a symptom that a person is feeling right now versus a symptom that the person feels on a continual basis? Um, and so it's important to recognize that these are diagnosable disorders and not necessarily just the symptoms that can also respond beautifully to um, uh, psychological services. Adjustment disorder is um, something that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, but adjustment disorder occurs 22%. So this is just like, how does the person, how's the person reacting in the first couple months of their diagnosis? Um, bipolar disorder occurs 13% of the time, and then psychotic disorder 3% of the time. And so as you can tell uh, by this, this graph, we can see that uh, mental health conditions are much more prevalent in um, the MS population than they are in the general population. And so these are the dynamic challenges of chronic disease. So we talked um, earlier about the invisible symptoms, um, the but you look so good. Um, and so that's a, that's a very difficult thing for our patients, these invisible symptoms. Um, in addition to the invisible symptoms, we see role reversal and identity shifts. So um, this is when uh, uh, somebody has to take on a new role that they're not used to in the family. So a spouse or a partner um, becomes stay at home and then the other one goes back to work and becomes the breadwinner. A child um, may become uh, a caregiver of some sort and uh, you know they're, they're very young when they do this. And so we see this role reversal and these identity shifts. Um, and so it's important to point out that MS of course doesn't just impact the patient and impacts the entire family dynamic. In addition, we see these emotional reactions. So grief and depression, of course, we talked, um, we talked about uncertainty. Um, there's anxiety and worry. Um, there can be anger. Um, there can be denial. Um, and then these uh, invisible symptoms. I think in addition, it's important to recognize that um, our patients really struggle sometimes with disclosure 
Um, so who do they disclose their, their diagnosis to and, and what a, a impact will these disclosures have? Um, also, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about how it's a difficult treatment decision uh, for patients. So they may be given, you know, a couple of treatment options and they may have to research those or, or really talk through them. And trying to make these very difficult treatment decisions can also be, be hard for them. Um, it can also, uh, we also have to recognize that planning and um, planning for the future and some uncertainty is there. So there's a lot of dynamic challenges of chronic illness. So I, I felt that in this time, it was important to talk a little bit about the COVID um, and what we've seen recently in our practice. So um, with regard to the COVID, and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but I think it's important that we um, do look a little bit at it. We do see a lot of a waves of emotion. And so um, for my patients, we see people who were, you know, pretty stable from an anxiety or a depression standpoint are now coming back to our practices um, and really having a difficult time um, with the isolation or the loneliness or the anxiety over the future. Um, and what they will describe is, you know, sometimes they're really down and then other moments they're very grateful for still having their health or a roof over their head or a partner to share this with. Um, and so there's just this kind of wave of emotion that they're experiencing. And what I like to tell my patients is that's very normal um, and something that we need to um, just allow them a space to process. There's a lot of uncertainty right now and a lot of information. Um, and so I think it's important that we kind of limit uh, the amount of uh, social media or, or media news, um, just get what we think is important right now. With the social distancing, we shared comes a lot of isolation and loneliness and then the economic uncertainty. And so we're seeing that this is causing decreases in well-being and psychological health and increases in uncertainty, depression, anxiety, and stress. Um, and I think it's just important to just you know, briefly touch on this right now in, in the era that we're in. Okay, so let's move on to collaborative medicine. So when my view from collaborative medicine comes from the Cleveland Clinic, I, you know, have spent my almost entire career at the Cleveland Clinic, including my fellowship, and, and now I'm going on 10 years at the Mellon Center. Um, and so I have a different view than maybe some others do, but I'd like to share um, what our view is because I think it's pretty unique and pretty special. So when I think about um, collaborative medicine, I think to myself the story about the blind man and the elephant. So um, I'm just going to take you through the story of the blind man and the elephant. So um, a group of blind men from Indistan had heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. And out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch of which we are capable. So they sought it out and when they found it, they groped about it. In the case of the first person whose hand landed on the trunk said, this being is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for another person whose hand was upon its leg, said the elephant is a pillar like a tree trunk. The blind man who placed his hand upon its side said the elephant is a wall, and another who felt its tail described it as a rope. The last felt its tusk and stated that the elephant is that which is hard and smooth like a spear. The six men fell into a great argument about the nature of the elephant, and they all called each other crazy because they have all held the elephant true in their own hands, but because they had never valued each other's opinions, no one even understood the full impact of the elephant. They were arguing about the elephant, and every one of them insisted that he was right. It looked like they were getting agitated. A wise man was passing by and he saw this. He stopped and asked them, what's the matter? And they said, we cannot agree to what the elephant is like. Each one of them told what he thought the elephant was. The wise man calmly explained to them, in fact, all of you are right. The reason every one of you is telling it differently is because each one of you has touched the elephant differently. 
And so actually, if you look at the elephant as a whole, it has all of those features, which you have all said. And so I love to look at the story and um, akin it to multidisciplinary care. And so as we move forward in a multidisciplinary model, I think we need to value the perspective of others. So we need to value the perspective of nursing and the value of social work and the value of behavioral medicine, neurology, um, PM&R, OT, PT, all of the groups that work together. And we need to look at our patients as a whole instead of just experiencing uh, the patient as who we see the patient as. Okay. So our interdisciplinary team is um, very unique, as I said earlier. Um, we, have, uh, we have neurology we, in terms of medicine and nursing. Uh, we have physical medicine and rehab. We have clinical research and we have behavioral medicine. And so my team falls into, of course, the behavioral medicine. And so um, I love the hashtag normalize, not stigmatize, if anyone's on Twitter. Um, this is something that um, I, I really, uh, really think is important because I think as psychologists, we need to recognize that behavioral medicine is just a normal part of one's um, everyday wellness. And this is an important part that we, um, that we bring to the table. And so we get uh, re referral sources from lots of different places. Of course, we get them from our neurology appointments. So many of our neurologists, even at um, initial diagnosis, will send to us just to um, create an open dialogue between us and our patients and to also um, help the patient to understand uh, what we do in behavioral medicine and to help them to see that it's not, you know, a place where people are lying down on couches or smoking cigars in the rooms. <laughs> We also get referrals from shared medical appointments. So in um, Mellon Center, we have a couple of shared medical appointments too that we get referrals from quite, quite often is our wellness shared medical appointment led by Dr. Renzel. Um, and then our neurology or newly diagnosed shared medical appointment, um, who we're actually a part of. Um, and it's led by uh, someone on my team, Dr. Kane or one of the um, fellows, as well as a neurology practitioner. And in that, we are kind of front line. So when a patient is newly diagnosed, they learn about the, both the physical aspects of um, MS, but they also learn about the psychological impacts and what we have to offer. And then um, through PT, OT, speech, um, through uh, social work, and then our research appointments. So we have lots of avenues for getting um, referrals. So when we think about um, how we screen for uh, the behavioral medicine needs, we um, have this unique process that occurs at the Mellon Center. So um, as somebody is initially um, checking into their appointment, they are given some, they're asked to provide some patient entered data, um, either through the MS Pass or for um, patient entered data that we have chosen in terms of questionnaires or other teams have chosen in, in terms of questionnaires. And so they take these questionnaires um, and then it's implanted into our um, secure Cleveland Clinic wireless system, which goes into our computer system and it shows up on the, compu on the computer of the uh, provider. And I think what's very unique about this is that we have several different screening tools that our patients get prior to uh, coming to their appointment. So um, of course there's the physician assessment um, and then there's the MSPT, um, which has uh, the ability to measure many um, mental health uh, needs of the patient. So we utilize the PROMISE, the PHQ-9, the NeuroQual. Um, we also have different questionnaires, such as um, the NeuroQual and the PHQ-9, which our patients take prior to coming to the practice, um, and uh, the GAD and the Pain Disability Index. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit about how this looks. So when we look at uh, our best practice alerts from the Neurological Institute, which is where the Mellon Center is housed, if an individual who takes the PHQ-9, which they take in the neurology appointments, as well as our appointment, has greater than, um, equal to or greater than a 15, um, they will, the neurologist will see a uh, best practice alert displayed for our patients. And in this, they will have to determine how they're going to manage the uh, patient's depression. And so you can see the different options here. And one of them is to send um, to see us. So it, it automatically delivers. They press a button, it 
it sends a consult to see us and um, the person is scheduled to see us. So it's, it's very uh, standard in their practice. Um, they see this pop up and they know that somebody may need some behavioral medicine support and so they can send uh, to see us. But there are also different things that the neurology teams can do. They can start the person on a medication, give them some um, literature, or again, send to see us. So this is very important for, for our practice because what we see in the PHQ-9, what I'm showing you on the screen, is um, a display of their symptoms over time. And so this is a patient uh, who came to see us initially in, um, in it looks like February. Um, and so the patient's PHQ-9 was relatively high. They had then come to see us, uh, looks like one time, and um, their PHQ-9 dropped. And it looks like that they came back to see us in October because their PHQ-9 was elevating again. This is important for us to track how the patient is doing, but it's also important for us to recognize um, how our treatment is going. Um, and so we utilize this, we show this to our patients to see that they can, maybe they could say, you know, something very particularly stressful was happening um, at these time points and they could put some um, description or clarity around it. So this is a slide from my dear friend, uh, uh, Claire Har Cleaver, and um, she uses that she uh, has since left the Mellon Center. Um, we miss her very much, uh, but she was a, a wonderful nurse practitioner um, that did some uh, work with my team because she really believed in behavioral medicine. And so, one of the things that she um, allowed me to take uh, from her was how she was able to um, refer patients to behavioral medicine so smoothly. <coughs> And so what she decided was that during the interview, um, she would ask very open-ended questions and she would uh, give information about behavioral medicine. And um, in that, she would ask the patients how they felt about it. She would also ask the patients if they had stress, anxiety, worry, or problems with their sleep. And if, the, if they did, how was this impacting their daily life and their family dynamics? She asked us at every single visit. So it became very normal um, for her patients to talk about behavioral medicine needs. And um, if she found that there was a PHQ-9 that was elevated at any given point, she would point that out again, showing um, how the patient was doing over time. And then she would send the patient to see us. So she utilized these screenings and assessments and just talking about it openly as a way to normalize behavioral medicine and definitely was our top referrer over time, um, which we really appreciated and just developed a great relationship with um, her and her patients and um, hopefully you know, helped help them as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of behavioral medicine. So we've been using this term quite a bit. And then um, what I wanted to share with you is first and foremost, um, behavioral medicine providers are um, individuals who, so, so if it's a psychologist, they're individuals who have gone to get their doctorate in psychology, which takes about six years. Um, and then in my case, um, I went on for an additional fellowship um, so I did two additional years of fellowship focused on the biopsychosocial model. And the biopsychosocial model is really um, looking at how medical conditions are impacted by your emotions, um, social factors, and how this all um, contributes to wellness um, or to your medical condition. And so in the end, um, eight years of training post-college uh, and um, so that's kind of what a behavioral med medicine specialist is in chronic disease. So what we do is we treat the patient. Um, we, we do evaluations. So if a patient comes in from, you know, out of state, we're able to do a quick consultation with the patient and uh, give this back to the patient to take with them to treatment. Um, we do treatment for individual group, uh, family and couples work, and we communicate with the referring provider. Um, right now, as the COVID crisis is occurring, it's been really nice because we're able to uh, give consultation to people who are, uh, you know, across the state or in many instances, um, there have been a release of um, uh, laws regarding state um, 
practice. And so we've been able to practice across state lines um, in some, some states. And so it's been really nice because people are able to come and see us who typically wouldn't be able to come and see us, um, come and see us virtually, I guess. Um, we also have a training program. So we train uh, two fellows a year. One is our primary fellow. So he uh, right now is, um, Dr. Davis is working on um, getting his fellowship training in MS care. And he, he is with us four days a week. And then we have one uh, minor fellow, um, Dr. Fink, who is with us one day a week. Um, and she's interested in understanding the impact of chronic disease on um, the, the whole person. And each of them are involved in their own research projects, um, which will be presented at uh, the CMSC virtual meeting, which is you know, wonderfully exciting for them because they've spent their whole year um, really focused on the research project and really wanting to, to get that out there. And so um, look for that coming up. All right. So when we think about um, what we do in behavioral medicine, it's looking at, I'm just checking my time here to make sure I'm on task, which I am. We really see um, these top three uh, things that we're, we're looking, that we treat uh, over and over again. One is depression. The next is adjustment disorders. And finally, a stress. So we'll talk specifically about each of them. So when we look specifically at depression, I'd like to present the case of Elaine. So Elaine was a patient that came to see me who was a 37-year-old woman, woman uh, with relapsing remitting MS diagnosed 10 years ago. She was referred for fatigue and tearful mood. And she described her mood as depressed and always exhausted. She described little enjoyment and activities her functional impairment impacted her ability to care for her children. She slept up to 16 hours a day and still never felt rested. Uh, she denied any changes in her appetite or weight. Um, her psychosocial included that she had children, a spouse, and family members that help her with um, her daily chores. And these are people that are very important to her. Um, and she felt a lot of guilt um, for feeling like a burden on them. Um, she, she was uh, very frustrated by her physical limitations and her need for family help. Um, and um, she had passive death wishes with no intent or plan or no previous uh, suicidal attempts. And these feelings have been present for about five years. So she was really struggling when she came to see us. And this is a typical case of somebody that we might see in our clinic. So when we look at depression, we know that depression differs from normal grieving. Um, what I see in our practice is that the symptoms um, are typically, there's more irritability than there is tearfulness. So I know um, when we think about depression, we oftentimes think about the, the tearfulness, but it's very interesting in our practice that the irritability tends to be higher than the tearfulness. We also hear this very often from uh, family members and they'll say things like, I just feel like I'm walking on eggshells around uh, this family member. So what we know about depression is that it is more common in females than males, but the strength is much greater in males. We also know that stressful life events are the strongest predictor for developing a depression. Um, and we know that individuals with chronic disease are at a greater risk than the general population. And we've already looked at these statistics, but to remind you again, because they're so big, up to 50 to 54% of people with um, MS will have a depression at some point over the course of their disease. And so again, this is three to four times as high as the general population. And then we also know that the suicide rate is much higher than in the general population. So what are some of the possible causes of depression in the MS population? Well, there's many. Um, disease activity. So we see depression around onset and exacerbation, which is why we have a, a sh short-term treatment model, but a long-term relationship. So even though somebody responds beautifully to treatment and they may be, you know, um, kind of managing their mood well, we still like to see them on a yearly basis because we want to keep our relationship with them. Just like a primary care doctor would see somebody, our practice will see somebody on a yearly basis because if somebody has an exacerbation, they're more likely to have a depression or an anxiety and to need kind of some boost treatments from us. There may be some neuropathological changes in the, in the areas of the brain related to uh, the affective states. 
there may be neuroendocrine or psychoimmunological changes. Um, there may also be a reaction to life changes, such as as quality of life decreases, we see depression increasing, which does make sense, of course. It can be a side effect of medications, so especially steroids, um, some of the earlier disease modifying therapies, narcotics and benzos can cause um, depression. And depression may be a symptom of MS as well as a reaction to MS. And I think that this is a really important point because when patients come to see us, um, they oftentimes say they, they call themselves weak for having depression. Um, and what I like to say to them is that this is oftentimes, it's a symptom of your MS. And so you're not weak, it's just that you have MS and this is a way that, uh, this is a symptom of your, your MS. And that tends to help people to, again, you know, going back to that normalize and not stigmatize uh, mental health, um, it goes back to normalizing uh, the need for treatment. Okay. So we did talk a little bit about the fact that, that suicide um, rates increase with the MS population. And so I did wanna talk a little bit about um, suicide risk factors. So specifically for completed suicide, um, risk factors are that a person is male, they are younger in age, and they have an earlier disease course. For suicidal ideation, uh, so these are people who are thinking about suicide, maybe even planning suicide at the moment, um, they are younger age, earlier disease course as well, progressive disease subtypes, a lifetime history of depression, anxiety, or alcohol abuse, depression severity, so in uh, higher depression severity, a family history of mental illness, social isolation, greater disability, lower income, and not driving. And so I wanted you to have this so that you can keep in mind people who may be at higher risk for suicidal ideation um, intent or even uh, suicide itself. So when we look at um, depression treatment, there are many ways that we manage depression in our patient population. Um, and so for us, we utilize the CBT model or the cognitive behavioral therapy model, which we will talk a little bit about uh, in the next slide. I felt like it was, uh, it was too important uh, because this is our primary way of treatment to just cover it in a, a brief sentence. Um, we also use um, the grief acceptance slash adaptation model from Kubler-Ross. And so we borrowed this uh, from, from Kubler-Ross's of death and dying. Um, and, it, and we've taken it and modeled it around our MS patient. And I think what's important with this model is that we recognize that people will have a number of emotions as they go through an, a diagnosis or a change in uh, function. Um, and so as people are having these changes, they're likely experiencing different emotional reactions. Um, so, you know, you, you remember the, the, you remember this model from um, the death and grief acceptance model. And so this is the person may experience anything from anger to denial, to shock, to depression. And then eventually um, they end up at acceptance in Kubler-Ross's theory. Um, this is not a linear model. So it's not like one person goes from one to the next diagnosis or to the next uh, symptom to the next. This is um, a personalized model for each person. Each person uh, manages grief very differently. And uh, a person's resiliency really um, is a, a strong factor here for how they're going to manage grief. Um, so it's not linear. It's something that occurs over time um, and is something that I think is very personal to each person. Well, in Kubler-Ross's theory, um, she ends with acceptance as the end point. And in ours, we didn't quite like the fact uh, that acceptance seems pretty passive. Uh, we feel like uh, our patients are very resilient. Um, and so we use the term adaptation. Um, we want to see how our patients adapt to their current environment, um, what they can do versus what they're not able to do. And so we really put a strong focus on adaptation and how they are still going to be able to, to live their best life. Um, also in, our, in the Mellon Center, we have group therapies. We have six group therapies that we offer, which we're all pretty proud of. Um, these are very unique offerings. Uh, we offer a young professionals group. We offer a caregiver support group. Um, we offer a neurocognitive uh, group. We offer a men's MS group. 
We offer a general MS support group, and then we have a group on sleep and fatigue. In addition, um, we, as I shared earlier, we um, participate in a shared medical appointment. So we do a lot of unique offerings um, at the Mellon Center. And our groups are supportive and interpersonal in nature. Um, sometimes we add some cognitive behavioral therapy and behavioral therapy uh, treatments to those. We also make you use of um, community support. So I feel like for people who don't you know, have a Mellon Center in their backyard, I think it's important to call on um, your societies and to see if there are people in your area who are doing support groups or um, providers who can uh, help with the behavioral medicine needs, which I know they're all over the country. Um, I've worked with some of the best um, and it's been really fun to get to work with them through the National MS Society um, and just to learn who the behavioral medicine providers are throughout the country. There are many, many great ones out there. So I shared that we're going to focus a little bit on what cognitive behavioral therapy is because I think it's, it's a really um, important uh, treatment that we offer our patients. So cognitive behavioral therapy focuses on the relationships between thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, and then the interaction of all of these on mood. So an example of cognitive behavioral therapy and restructuring might be, I'm afraid of ending up in a wheelchair or my life is ruined. And then a person um, describes their feelings associated with that. So, they're eight, so typically when somebody comes into your office, they're able to say, you know, I just, I just feel sad or irritable, but they're not able to put into place what makes them feel sad or irritable. So this is really focusing on those thoughts um, that create those feelings and then giving them the opportunity to work through those thoughts and then helping them to restructure uh, those thoughts, which will then restructure their mood. So symptom, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, it's short-term treatment duration, and it occurs typically in four to 16 weeks. Um, I was able to find Don Ede's um, study on telemedicine, um, and it shows just extremely positive uh, results. And so I think that's really important for us now, knowing that our patients don't only need to come into the clinic to get treatment, but they're getting positive results um, even via video conferencing or telemedicine. Another different mode of delivery, like we shared earlier, is in group therapy. So some of the things that we incorporate are stress management, breathing, visualization, and mindfulness-based interventions. And as we go through this presentation, I will teach you some of those. Okay, so another way that patients are treated with, uh, another way that patients with depression are treated is with pharmacotherapy. Um, <coughs> So when we look at pharmacotherapy, the two classes that are most commonly used are the SSRIs and the SNRIs. So the SSRIs are typically recommended as the first line treatment for anxiety and depression. And then the SNRIs are recommended um, for additional anxiety or pain. <clears throat> there are some potential medication interactions with both of them, which I've listed here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, the second that we're going to talk about is adjustment disorder. And so um, adjustment to the disease is a very normal reaction. So it can cause anxiety and depression um, in the newly diagnosed patient. Most of the large epi epidemiological surveys of the general population really lack prevalence for data for adjustment disorder, um, but the best estimate is between 21 and 37 percent of our patients will have uh, adjustment disorder. So what is adjustment disorder? Well, it's the development of anxious mood or depressed symptoms in response to um, a medical condition or disease that occurs within the first three months of the diagnosis. Um, this is also important uh, because as a person's uh, function changes in the MS uh, population, um, they can also develop adjustment disorder at that time. So it's characterized by marked distress and significant impairment in social or occupational functioning, and the treatment is Normalizing, empathizing, education is key here. It's really important in an adjustment uh, disorder. Stress management, also very important. And medication, if necessary, um, in time. 
And I felt like I wanted to spend just a quick moment talking about anxiety because um, anxiety is certainly a symptom of adjustment disorder. And when it goes into an anxiety disorder, um, you know, we've passed adjustment disorder and we need to treat it as, as such an anxiety disorder. So there are several subtypes of anxiety disorder. There's generalized anxiety disorder, OCD, the panic, <clears throat> social phobia, PTSD, and specific phobias. And so you see the risk factors, but I think that the symptoms are what's important to focus on here. So these are people who are very hypervigilant about changes in um, their environment or in their body. They can be restless, they can be irritable. Um, physiological symptoms are very common. So GI symptoms, palpitations, feeling like chest heaviness, um, sweating. They can have lack of concentration, racing thoughts, excessive worry and fear, a feeling of impending doom, insomnia, and fatigue. So again, very important to get the, um, to make sure that we're diagnosing people with the right um, diagnosed mental health diagnosis. And so these are more the anxiety disorders where I was just speaking about the adjustment disorders. So adjustment disorders usually um, resolve within three sometimes six months, and then anxiety disorders are the more chronic condition. Okay, and our third is stress management. And this is really where we focus a lot of our practice um, attention on. So the effects of stress are just very significant. So I told you earlier that we practice from a biopsychosocial model and we incorporate wellness. And that's really important to understand because when we look at the effects of stress on the body, I mean, it impacts everything from your mood, to your cognition, um, to your cardiac uh, to system, to your immune system, to your GI system, sexual dysfunction, um, and, and joints and, and uh, muscle pain. It, it really, stress really impacts the entire body. And so it's important for us to uh, spend some time focusing on how we manage stress. So when we look at um, stress management, I think what's important is that we see, <clears throat> we look at the literature. So um, Charcot, as he was defining MS in the late 1800s, noted even then that stress um, was a contributing factor to uh, the MS person's diagnosis. We also saw several correlational studies, and these are just you know a couple of them, um, that had looked at war from both the soldiers and people in the country and found that as the war ended, um, both the soldiers and the people that were impacted by the war in their country had an increase in MS um, cases. And then in 2010, there was a study by um, David Moore and his colleagues at Northwestern. And so this is his study. It's a randomized trial with stress management for the prevention of new brain lesions. Um, and it really changed the way that we practiced. And so I wanted to go through this study uh, briefly with you. So this is Moore's study where he looked at 121 MS patients. They were randomly assigned to treatment or control group. In the treatment group, there were 16 50-minute individual sessions over 24 weeks, plus a follow-up at six months. Um, and the measures were MRI with GAD and T2 brain lesions. And so what he found were that therapy helped people to better estimate the potential impact of a perceived threat and gave them skills to manage their stress better. He also found that when stress couldn't be avoided, he taught, his team taught meditation and relaxation strategies to calm their physical responses. And I really love this, and we use this every day in our clinical practice, is that for an event or a situation to be stressful, it must present as two factors. It has to feel like a threat to something that a person highly values. So in uh, RMS practice, our patients would say that that's their function. Um, their independence, the list goes on and on. And they must believe that they don't have any control over the situation. And so the results were that the stress management group had a decrease in brain lesions in the MS patients. There were 77% fewer GAD enhancing lesions compared to 55% of the control and 70% free of T2 lesions versus 43% of the control. Now, what's important about this study is that after the therapy was completed, new lesions were detected. So meaning once people were finished doing their stress management, 
the results did not continue or the benefits did not continue. So how have we uh, then contributed to uh, creating stress management in our own uh, practice? Well, we've drawn from the study and what we did was we created a four session stress management protocol. Um, we believe that our patients are highly active and functional and um, for the most part, they are you know, really living their best lives and, and we hope to be a contributing factor to that. Um, and so what we heard from our patients is that they felt like, you know, they could, they could, uh, they could agree to four sessions, but they weren't going to agree to the full, full 16 sessions. And so um, we do four sessions over the course of four to six, six weeks, each is over the course of four to six weeks. So it's actually over the course of four to six months. So every four to six weeks, a patient comes to see us. Um, in this, it's, um, we teach skills of CBT and breathing skills. It's very short time, term, and each skill builds off of the next, and they need to practice this outside of our four walls because it's very important for them to learn how to do this in their lives versus what they do in session. All right, so I'm going to walk you through some of the skills that we um, teach here. So the first is the mind-body connection. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pretend that prior to coming here today, um, I grabbed a cutting board and some lemons and I cut the lemons. And if you were in the audience, I would give you a piece of the lemon. And what I want you to do is pretend that I have given you a piece of this nice juicy lemon with juice just oozing over the sides of it. And I want you to take this lemon and put it in your mouth and bite down on it. And just notice what's happening physiologically in your body. Okay, next I want you to pretend that you have a roll of aluminum foil with you. And you crumple up this aluminum foil and you're putting your fingers in it and you're feeling what that feels like. And then you're gonna take that also and you're gonna put that wad of aluminum foil into your mouth and bite down on it. And I just want you to notice what's happening to your body from a physiological perspective. And next, you know, if you're like my house, you come home and you see all these Amazon boxes outside of your door and inside is wonderful styrofoam. So I want you to rip it. I want you to pretend like you're putting your fingers in it. And if you want, you can put that styrofoam in your mouth or you can just draw your fingers down the styrofoam and notice what's happening in your mouth or your body. And finally, imagine that there is a chalkboard behind me. And if I had long nails, I would take my long nails and I would scratch it all the way down that chalkboard. I just want you to sit with that and think about what's happening in your body. So in the end, what I wanted to show you was that despite the fact that I'm not even in the same room with you, I'm on an internet somewhere in Ohio, um, you likely were having a physiological response to the lemons or the aluminum foil <clears throat> or the chalkboard uh, or the styrofoam. All of these physiological responses come from a memory of them. And despite the fact that these were not, you were not physically handling them or biting down on them or tasting them or whatever it may be, your body was still producing a physiological reaction. And so this is the best way that I can show you the effects of the mind-body connection here. And so let's talk a little bit more about skills practice. And so um, what I'd like for you to do now is I'm just going to get my phone and I'm going to time you. For the next minute, all I want you to do is to breathe and count your breaths, okay? So when I ask you to start, I'm going to time you. All I want you to do is breathe, try to relax, and count your breath. Okay, go.
Okay, step. And so at this moment, I just want you to, you know, think in your head how many breaths you had. And I also want you to think about what this experience was like. So most people would say something like, wow, that was like the longest moment of my life. Um, thinking about what they were going to do after this. Um, and then most people would have over 12 breaths per minute. And so in our practice, um, we really want to decrease that. So in a psychological practice, breathing more than 12 breaths per minute is considering hyperventilation. And hyperventilation is just, you know, dangerous. <laughs> um, it's dangerous to uh, our body. It's dangerous to our brain. Um, it reduces oxygen delivery to all of our vital organs, in particular, our brain. And so a skill that I teach is called diaphragmatic breathing. So if I was with you in person, I would work you through this. Um, but diaphragmatic breathing is really just finding that large muscle located between the chest and the abdomen and learning how to pull the breath from the chest into the diaphragm. There are a lot of benefits of diaphragmatic breathing, um, physical, emotional, cognitive benefits. Um, and so it's also just a very excellent tool to stimulate the relaxation response. Um, and it results in less tension and an overall sense of well being. So I like to take diaphragmatic breathing even one step further, and I utilize what's called um, circular three breathing. So circular three breathing is a uh, technique that we um, teach our patients, which takes the diaphragmatic breath um, and incorporates then visualization and mindfulness. And so the way that you do circular three breathing is you start at the bottom and you inhale slowly on that first arrow to the left, you inhale for three seconds, you hold your breath for three seconds, and you exhale for three seconds. And so what I'm betting, if I was a betting person, is that you would be able to decrease that number, that first number that you had, with now what we're going to do for our second time, which is to breathe again for one minute. And this entire circle, so this nine second breath, if you will, um, is one breath. And so what I want you to do now is to listen to me as I take you through this breathing exercise, um, counting your breaths. And I'm going to take you through one cadence, and then I want you to take your own because I think we all you know, breathe at different rates. Um, but keep this in mind, keep this visualization in mind, keep the counting in mind. So each is three seconds, three second breath in, three second hold, and three second exhale. And I want you to start now. I want you to breathe in, two, three, hold, two, three, out, two, three. And go on yourselves. Okay, stop. And so um, if you have that number, I'd like for you to compare it to your first number. And my hope is that your breath per minute decreased. Um, my guess is also that this time you were able to focus more clearly on the visualization and that you were more mindful and in the moment. And so you weren't thinking about, you know, what's ahead of you or what's behind you, um, you know, other thoughts in your head. Okay. So we're, we're gonna go into kind of the last phase of our um, presentation today, which is about resiliency and skill building. And um, resiliency, again, I felt this was really important for you to have right now, given the COVID crisis, um, but also for our MS patients. So how do we develop resiliency? Well, first it's understanding. So we invest as much time and energy to learn as much about the situation as possible. Next, we learn how to manage. So we learn new coping strategies and behaviors and figure out how to be the best we can be. And then there's this growth mindset. So our experience shifts in priorities and we develop a better understanding of what's important. We pursue our passions. So this is 
kind of how I shared earlier that we, we focus on adaptation. This is something that you're welcome to take with you. I actually got this from the National MS Society and it's just 13 skills of how to develop resiliency. And I just loved them. I thought that these were real, very important. You're welcome to take them. You're welcome to utilize them in your own practice. Um, and I loved this. I got this also from the MS Society's uh, webpage. So a diamond is just a piece of charcoal that handled stress exceptionally well. And I think of our patients as just so incredibly resilient. Um, and uh, here I have five recommendations to cope with stress. So one is making wellness a priority. So wellness is maintaining a healthy diet, exercise or movement routine, um, maintaining a routine, being spiritual if that's what you choose, um, having a well-being uh, mindset, and getting proper sleep. Next is really taking a break from media and social media, um, staying informed from a trusted source. So um, 30 minute blocks in the AM and the PM and protecting children and the elderly from incorrect information. And I find this a lot in the uh, COVID crisis right now. Um, we really need to provide age appropriate information to our children so that they are not um, fearful of uh, you know, the, the news that they're hearing and make sure that we're able to process that with them. It's also important to sleep, um, rest and recharge. So when we're thinking about the COVID crisis, it's important to not, um, to, to not watch news outlets within a one hour time frame of going to bed, limit our stimulants and alcohol and nicotine before bed, stay on a normal sleep wake cycle. Um, create a worry journal. If you're finding that you're really worried about something um, and you're having a hard time of letting those worries go. Um, and then maybe find a wind down routine. Four is staying connected with others. So reaching out to family, friends, and colleagues, particularly those that we know are isolated. So our MS patients may be isolated. Some, um, uh, some of our older population may be isol isolated. Um, sending a card, a FaceTime, um, doing a FaceTime or a Skype meeting, and becoming creative and connecting. And then finally, utilizing these stress management techniques. So I taught you some of them, um, and so I hope that that was helpful for you. Um, but I want to just encourage that if patients, um, if people with MS are in need of treatment, I think it's very important to seek mental health help to um, really manage our worries and our our fears, our isolation, um, so that it doesn't become unmanageable. And then again, learning creativity uh, or putting into place creativity in terms of coping. So wrapping up here, here are a couple of resources um, for you to take with you. Um, like I said, the National MS Society also has a wonderful page, it's a navigator page where you can see um, who all of the behavioral medicine providers are throughout the country, and there's a lot of really wonderful providers, but there's also a crisis text line, there's a suicide crisis line, and an AMI helpline. Um, and as we wrap up today, I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to present this information to you. Um, it's really important for me to teach people about how to normalize mental health so that our patients are able to recognize uh, their mental health needs um, as, a, as a symptom of their MS for the most case, um, and so that they're able to then get treatment um, and from the appropriate providers, and that also providers are able to work in an interdisciplinary nature. I think that that's what makes um, the Mellon Center so special is that our treatment team is is highly um, interdisciplinary and we all respect each other uh, from a strong uh, perspective and really listen to what each person has to say about the patient. So going back to the blind man and the elephant, even though we're each touching just one area of the person, um, we're pulling it together and creating a comprehensive view of the patient. So thank you so much for this opportunity to June, to Tina, to the entire CMSC team, to um, Neurology Live. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. The information is on the screen. Thank you.